most of us, if at all, at Spice Magazine, interpreters uh, have had to put up. Um, the comment is not always positive or flattering. It's made by the client, self appointed uh, linguist on duty. That's the way I like to call them. Uh, and uh, my response in such a case will depend on the type of comment and also on the person who makes it. So we may have to put up with various types of comments. The worst type, of course, vitriolic, aggressive, overly hostile, confrontational, and even outright insulting. Those people who make those comments are often the ones who have uh, very little respect or consideration for translators. Then we have the nuisance comments, often made to obtain a discount, <laughs> which is a common practice of some agencies, especially in the States, um, but also of some direct clients. Then we have the comments made by the busybodies, uh, usually people who have uh, high school French or high school something. Um, and, uh, <coughs> they want to show off, often in the hope of impressing their bosses or fellow employees. Uh, life for them must be very boring in, uh, in companies or institutions. <laughs> part of uh, the office politics, uh, we start uh, uh, criticizing uh, translators' uh, work. Then the last type of comment could be the mild inquisitive comments also made to show off, but without overly aggressive intent. So those we can usually uh, Let's <coughs> take the first category. And uh, quite often it will start uh, with a message that says, uh, uh, <coughs> Hi, we found numerous instances of errors, mistranslations in your document. Ah. So, there are two possible scenarios. A listing of all those errors and mistranslations may be provided. Or, which is hard to believe, <coughs> it may also happen that um, no listing will be provided, no example, um, <laughs> not anything. So, what I would do in the scenario one would be to check all instances of so called errors and mistranslations and uh, respond appropriately. Uh, in in many cases, uh, of course, one can point out that those so-called errors are just a matter of a personal preference or taste, because one has to stress that translation is not an exact science, it's not rocket science, either. and um, differences of opinion and taste can and do exist. A sentence or text can lend itself to various interpretations especially if it is badly written, unclear, muddled, and ambiguous, um, which is often the case, and uh, I would say now, nowadays it's probably 90% of the time uh, the case. Probably not. So one should shift the responsibility to the author or to the entity employing who or representing that person. One standard response I've often given in such cases is, I don't have a crystal ball. You know, uh, I do my best, I try to interpret uh, what I see on paper or on screen. Um, but beyond that, um, it's not my job to second guess what the person has been trying to say. And, uh, was not able to say. <clears throat> now, in scenario number two, if 
no listing is provided, my response will be, well, wonderful. Uh, I will then wait for you to send me a detailed and precise listing of all so-called errors, mistranslations, to give you my response. Until then, have a good day. That's, that's what I would think, but I, would think that, uh, I don't say it, uh, not, at, not at that stage yet. Uh, I still give them uh, a chance to redeem themselves. So, a translator's response will often depend on the demand for his or her services. One may have more work than one can handle. Can I have a show of hands here? Uh, how many of you have more work than you can handle? Uh, not that many. No. Number two, enough work. How would you say? Enough work. That's a little bit better. And not enough work. No. Now, at this stage, at this time, I, I'm happy to say, um, and you will be, I hope, happy to learn that I have more work than I can handle. Uh, but it was not the case uh, two years ago. Uh, I sold my company to a colleague, and uh, I was expecting to uh, receive work from him, but for some reasons uh, it did not happen. And so, for uh, a full year, um, I um, did not have uh, enough work. Um, it may have been due to um, bad forecasting or uh, mismanagement, or uh, I may have been over optimistic for whatever reason. So, uh, after a year, I thought, well, uh, I still have some uh, mileage under the hood and uh, lots of bills to pay. I'd better uh, find some work, more work at least, which I did. And um, I uh, increased my networking, I did some marketing and, and so on. And um, so for the last year, yes, uh, I've had uh, plenty of work. But uh, as you know, it's often uh, feast or famine. And uh, one can never be too sure. Yeah. So that will, to some extent, dictate uh, your approach to um, those uh, difficult clients. Um, comments of the second category. That nuisance comments often made to obtain a discount or common practice of some agencies. Uh, usually, I will tell them no deal. I cannot possibly agree with you that this or that was a mistake. So, I suggest that this be the end of our discussion on this subject. And uh, usually, I'll never hear from those people again, or if they come back, I ask them to uh, pay me a retainer before I start, which also never happened. <laughs> so comments of the third and fourth categories, uh, those comments made by busybodies who want to show off in the hope of impressing their bosses or fellow employees. Yes, that's, um, that's a regrettable uh, occurrence in some companies, as you all know. There will be the person who may have picked up a few words here and there. Uh, or Maybe uh, they're coming from a country where, uh, yes, it's uh, everyday language, and um, yeah, they may want to look smart. Um, and um, it's, it's difficult, of course, to um, tell the client that, well, uh, yes, uh, the comment is well taken, but uh, I, uh, I'm a professional translator and I have a better idea, and that's, I stick to what I put. Uh, then the other type of comments, the mild and primitive comments, uh, made to show off also, but without the aggressive intent. And uh, again, you can brush them off and uh, answer with a, a smile or a 
or smiley or uh, kind response uh, without uh, going to battle. So I'm going to describe the diplomatic or conciliatory approach. Uh, of course, with scenario one, uh, when everyone is uh, in ideal position to fight back, you have nothing to lose. Um, and if you feel that the comments from the client are unfair and uh, justified and uh, even insulting or contemptuous, then there is not much room left for the diplomatic approach. Uh, my response would then be, well, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm giving you until the 15th or whatever, uh, 30 days from the date appearing on my invoice to pay my fee or I'll take you to court. I wish you the best of luck in your search for the perfect <laughs> translation services provider. I can even give you a few addresses where they could tend to be perfect. <laughs> so, you will need luck. In the meantime, for as long as my fee has not been paid, please refrain from using my translation, which is material protected under the Canada Copyright Act. That may be true, I hope so, I'm not... <laughs> there is, I think, uh, a page in the uh, ATIO website where it says uh, that we are protected under the Canada Copyright Act. Um, and uh, I think many years ago they asked for a lawyer's uh, opinion on that. But it's uh, still worth using that argument um, because uh, it has helped me in many cases when a client uh, was slow in paying or reluctant or whatever. I would tell them, uh, well, um, you know, I'm allowing you to use my translation for the time being, uh, and it's been uh, over 30 days, and um, starting tomorrow, if I don't get paid now, uh, I will invoke uh, the Copyright Act, and I will ask for an injunction to stop you from using my translation. Uh, and if you don't, well, uh, I will ask for punitive damages, and penalties, and so on, you know, I accumulate. And um, if my translation is used um, uh, to sell a product, if it's uh, printed on uh, packages, for instance, or manuals inserted uh, in a box with a product, um, I will um, start legal proceedings to have your product pulled out the shelves in uh, more marts and uh, all over the place. And um, surprisingly, it, it has worked. One time I had delivered uh, a very tra difficult translation, difficult because it was done in uh, uh, a special uh, computer program, uh, AutoCAD or Autodesk, uh, where there are various layers of text. So it, it, it was a nightmare. I, I thought I was going to make a decent profit by charging close to a dollar a word. And uh, in the end, uh, I think I may have broken even, I'm not so, so sure. But then when I delivered uh, that uh, project out of hell, uh, I was told, uh, oh, well, yes, um, uh, you know, we are waiting for the architect uh, to uh, receive his fee, and then the architect will pay us, and then we will pay you. So, uh, it's great. Uh, so uh, how long do you think it's going to take? 
well, about six months. And by then I had paid several uh, colleagues uh, to, to help me with the formatting, with the translation. I had spent countless nights, uh, weekends, and so on. So I was not, I was out of my pocket, I don't know, $5,000 already at least. And I was not going to wait for six months. So I told them, look, um, 30 days, not one day more. Um, otherwise, I will call and I will contact Walmart and tell them that uh, they are not supposed to use my translation. So, uh, yeah, for a, a client of a big company, it doesn't look good if the big company receives uh, threats of injunctions and uh, lawsuits from uh, uh, Greek freelance translator who is uh, clamoring for his money. So they paid, and uh, they were fair. They said, uh, well, uh, we have to say that uh, we admire the way you write your contracts. <laughs> I was flattered, I must say. Uh, this is what I put at the bottom of my invoices. So it is understood that translations are protected works under the Copyright Act and may not be reproduced or otherwise used in breach of the translator's copyright. Certified translator or Hereby signs his her copyright in the work contemplated herein. See, it sounds very legally there. <laughs> to the client, but such assignment is conditional upon the certified translator having received full payment for services rendered in accordance with ATIO standard terms. And this actually is uh, not coming out of my entire brain, but it's also in part what appears in uh, the ATIO website. So uh, you may use it freely, it's not uh, copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> and if it helps you cash in and get paid for your efforts, uh, by all means, you know. And, uh, I can say that um, uh, it has saved me some time and uh, aggravation, and uh, I think that when clients see that, uh, on the contract or at the bottom of an invoice, uh, they may think, well, it's not worth uh, getting all that trouble and um, infringing the law and all that for a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. So, if uh, there is a dispute, I can also suggest to the client that we submit the material dispute to my professional associations, Translation Quality Assessment Committee. I don't know how they call it at the ATIO, uh, something like that. Um, and uh, the user pays the cost. Again, um, it will be something that the client uh, will have to think twice about. Um, can be present. And it's often enough to make a bellicose client cool down and have her pay the fee as a deal or at least agree to a compromise solution. Case closed. I, I usually don't like to give uh, a discount and use a this, yeah, discount to uh, you know, get paid uh, at least 90% of my fee, but sometimes. Um, it's better to have a, a bad compromise than a good lawsuit. One last ditch attempt at mending fences, also used all the scenarios two and three, would be to say, may I ask what the reviewer's credentials and experience are in the field of translation? More specifically, are they in any way comparable to mine? See the CV attached. Okay, so big guns coming off. Uh, <laughs> why are you compared to me? Uh, uh, usually it's high school French, uh, uh, high school English, 
high school Spanish. Uh, yeah. And then how proficient is that person in the use of both languages? Then again, it makes it very embarrassing for them to provide the precise answers to those two questions. And um, I may ask a few other pointed questions. And that's what I've done, for instance, uh, in the case of a pharmaceutical client who uh, sent me a message saying, uh, Miss so and so, um, find, found mistakes uh, in your translation or um, grammatical mistakes, and uh, she wanted and the style also um, she had to change and uh, correct and so on. And um, so I had to insist a little bit so that I could see what the um, corrections would be. And um, no, those were stylistic and grammatical and, and uh, spelling mistakes that I would have had to introduce in my translation. So I, I told them, uh, uh, no, it doesn't hold water. Uh, and um, what are your viewers' credentials? Because I suspected the person was not a native francophone. She uh, had an Indian name. And indeed, yes, she uh, had come from India. And uh, she had spent uh, a year, I think, working as an intern in France, uh, which uh, definitely made her uh, an expert at uh, translating English to French. And um, I received after that um, a message from that person who uh, said uh, that she agreed with these changes I was uh, suggesting. So I, I said, okay, I'll take your changes, but how would you think uh, maybe we could also uh, uh, rephrase this and that, like that. So I kept some elements of her corrections, and uh, uh, she could see, uh, yeah, she, she or could, could feel that she had been useful, and uh, after that, uh, again, the, the case was closed, and uh, we remained on uh, good terms, and we kept the client. So, with the diplomatic or conciliatory approach, my response looked like this. I take due note of your comments, which I'm sure are meant to be constructive and positive, even if I don't the word. <laughs> but that's what diplomats are for, you know? They say, they say the contrary of what they think. <laughs> but they say it nicely. So, we can all learn from each other, and you should also learn from us. And you could learn how to write, for instance. And we're all part of the same team with one common purpose, the highest level of quality in the work we do. Beautiful. It is both a pleasure and a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> and to be able to work with professionals such as you, and I look forward to, do, to maintaining and improving the fruitful and collaborative relationship we have established over the last few months and years. Yeah. Uh, now, a uh, few cases. I'm sure you all have had uh, clients from health, <laughs> and with some people we never win. Um, for instance, there was um, a company uh, who had started sending me articles uh, on cancer research uh, that were supposed to be published in a medical uh, review and um, I looked at those articles there were very high level research reports written by uh, cancer experts 
uh, but very badly written. It looked like there were raw transcription from dictation, uh, which the author had never bothered to proofread. So, um, not being an expert in that field, I knew a well, world-renowned uh, cancerologist, francophone, uh, brother of one of my uh, uh, schoolmates. And, uh, I asked him if he was interested, and he said yes, he had a look, and he said, oh, I could have written those articles. So that's great. So I gave it to him. Um, he did a fairly good translation. Uh, but I still had uh, some misgivings uh, and hesitations. I thought some of uh, the sentences were still clumsily phrased. And I asked another medical translator, uh, an MD who also has uh, an MA in translation, <coughs> if he could have a look. And uh, he rewrote a lot of it. And he told me that, well, next time let's do it the other way. I'll, I'll do the translation first. And if there are some fine points uh, that I cannot resolve, we can ask the uh, cancerologist to have a look. And uh, he was absolutely right, that that's what I should have done. And after that, I had a look at uh, the uh, revised translation, and I made a few uh, suggestions of my own, uh, mostly stylistic. And um, so my uh, MD translator colleague approved or rejected some of my suggestions. And the end result was, I thought, uh, a pretty good piece, you know. Uh, uh, not, not everyone would go to such lengths to do a translation. So I sent it to the client and then uh, came back with the comments. Uh, yeah, there, there are uh, many mistakes in the translation. Um, uh, stylistic, grammatical, uh, Spelling also is too long. <laughs> so I asked if I could see the list of mistakes uh, provided with the complaint. Ah, uh, no, uh, the, the person who reviewed it, um, well, she's not a translator, she's uh, bilingual, secretary, and, and she's not sure uh, that the changes. Uh, she is suggesting are all valid. All right, uh, show me those changes. I'll, I'll be able to tell which ones are valid and, and which ones are crap. <laughs> well, uh, no, um, she feels uneasy about that. And uh, uh, please uh, have a look at your document and make make all the necessary corrections. <laughs> So, I read the full 3,000 words all over again. Uh, yeah, it was way too long, so I managed to um, remove about 92 words. <laughs> my best. And then the spelling mistakes, yeah, I found an A where I forgot, someone forgot to put uh, a great accent. But in the sentence, it uh, had no bearing on the meaning of the sentence or the understanding of the sentence. The sentence was uh, perfectly understandable, and uh, so nothing really uh, earth shattering there. Uh, so I called the client. I said, uh, "Voila, uh, I uh, removed 92 words, uh, which will uh, make." Uh, the whole piece uh, a lot more pleasant to read <laughs> and, and faster to read the person will save uh, 40 seconds uh, <laughs> and I found uh, yeah uh, uh, spelling mistake yeah, the, that grave accent I forgot to put it on the ah. And the person said, uh, oh, well, uh, you see, uh, for the price we pay you, 
um, you could have got that, you should have done it, uh, and that's intolerable, and uh, really uh, we were expecting uh, a lot better from you than that. And I said, yeah, but uh, have you ever heard, uh, have you ever used uh, the services of any other translator in the past? Uh, uh, you will find in the odd typo in everybody's piece, uh, especially 3,000 words. Uh, and uh, as I said, it is not that important. So um, I said, uh, you should look at the original instead of wasting my time. Uh, proofreading the whole thing to catch uh, an accent. Uh, the original uh, was definitely full of mistakes, uh, non sequiturs, uh, um, sentences without a verb, um, uh, lots of problems with that. So uh, why didn't you spend some time rewriting that original? Well, it's uh, an authority in cancer research and all that. Yes, but still, it does not give him the right to write badly. So uh, I could see it was an endless conversation. And then I said, look, uh, that's the case. Uh, we better part our ways. And uh, uh, again, I wish you the best of luck in finding uh, the perfect uh, uh, supply of translation services. Uh, you will need it. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jorsen said, uh, Surprised, but does that mean that you are dismissing us as a client? So uh, you bad lady. <laughs> I, uh, I don't ever want to work for you, and I never did. Uh, in a way, I was glad because it was, as we say, pearls thrown to the proverbial swines. So when you feel it's time to let go, let go. Did they pay you Oh, yes, because I told them, look at the copyright. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that they pay you one dollar per word? Oh, no, that was the one that had been done to be done in uh, AutoCAD format. This ah. was done in uh, MS Word, so uh, uh, um, no, that, uh, I wish I could have been paid. <laughs> 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 It took a lot, a lot of work, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In the end, you wonder, plus uh, all the aggravation and time spent back and forth, and then reading the whole thing uh, a second time, trying to catch one word here, one word there, to, to satisfy them, and then they are still not happy. Uh, so, that time not uh, enough is enough. Yeah. Um, another case history was uh, a person who had a, a marketing services company and uh, they would give us uh, surveys to translate and uh, every page was always very packed in English. So uh, the challenge was to try because we were supposed to uh, put uh, everything also on the page in the French version, uh, rewrite all the so it took a lot of time, um, and it was, I think, uh, the days before um, the PCs and uh, MS Word and all that. Uh, I was still using uh, the huge MyCom word processors, like not this. And uh, so it was a lot of. Uh, time wasted uh, working on the format. And uh, yeah, the, the lady was never happy. So in the end, I didn't know what to do. Um, I uh, contacted a colleague and I said, uh, Oh, I have a great client here. <laughs> <laughs> Delightful lady. Uh, easy stuff, you know, uh, ideal fit for you. What do you think? I'm too busy. I was not, but, and uh, would you like to take care of her? I said, yeah, yeah, by all means. So I 
transfer the client to the colleague. And uh, after a few weeks, he called me back and he said, uh, she's driving us crazy. <laughs> um, what can we do with her? Okay, I will um, try so and so. Uh, maybe he's more patient than you and I together. Which I did. Same scenario. After two, three weeks, the guy calls me, uh, about to go crazy. Uh, she's never happy, she complains all the time, and uh, what should we do? I said, yeah, tell her to fly a kite. Uh, fly else. And uh, that was the end of my relationship with that uh, particular lady. Except that uh, a couple of years later I moved into a building on the 8th floor. She was <laughs> yeah, she was on the 11th floor. <laughs> so I always made sure that uh, whenever I spot her stepping in the elevator, uh, So, um, I could go on and on. One time I had uh, an insurance company that was giving me uh, translations, and uh, again, they, they were never happy. And um, I gave them to a colleague who uh, kept them for a while, and um, then the client called me back, asked me if I wanted to take them back, and I said, uh, I said no, and again, are you dismissing us as a client? And I had to say yes, because uh, there was also an element of uh, disrespect there. I could feel that uh, for that person, the translators were like the servants, you know, uh, just good to uh, sweep the floors and uh, do a few words here and there, and that was it, you know. So there is uh, really a, a threshold below which uh, we have to say enough is enough. So we have, of course, the other side of the story, translator from hell, <laughs> <laughs> joys of subcontract. Uh, I had uh, a client, a, uh, pharmaceutical company, well-known multinational, and they were sending us uh, work um, uh, to do from uh, French into English, and uh, it had uh, little to do with uh, pharmaceuticals or medicine, um, because uh, in order to import their products from France to Canada, they had to submit uh, piles and piles of uh, documents and specifications and uh, plans and so on on uh, their manufacturing facilities in France and uh, those documents were very badly written I must say that the French may think that they are the greatest in the world but uh, those documents were sometimes uh, pure garbage. They, they were written uh, uh, well, ungrammatically and um, by people who, whose language may not have been French, but usually they, they were the ones who wrote the best French. Uh, the, the native French writers, uh, they may have been engineers or technicians or whatever, they were writing on uh, uh, plumbing systems in those facilities, electrical systems, uh, energy, steam, uh, you name it. Um, and um, it was sometimes very ambiguous, very vague, and you have to, you know what it is, and you have to read between the lines. Um, it was written sometimes phonetically, uh, which for French is great because. Uh, depending if a verb is uh, ending by ER or E, a 
accident, it, it can change, you know. Uh, if you say, j'ai été mangé, hier, to eat, j'ai été mangé, hier, accident, uh, then uh, you may not be able, you may not be there to, to be able to tell uh, about the experience. <laughs> So um, I was personally I was swamped with work uh, and working into English. I tried to give that to native speakers on of English. And my assistant um, had that brilliant idea to tell me, well, um, so and so, who is uh, a professor at U of T, PhD, and usually does a pretty good job for us. Uh, yeah, translating. Copy. Um, why don't we ask it? And I said yes. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, we think we think he can uh, uh, work in that field, engineering. Um, you know, I have a look at it, and it's badly written. And she said, no, no, no. Give it to him. Uh, you'll see. So off went the twenty thousand words to that colleague who. Uh, delivered uh, fairly promptly because he was broke and uh, asked if we could uh, also pay him uh, immediately. So I said, yeah, all right, uh, okay, so I wrote him a check for over $4,000. And uh, then uh, we were getting close to deadline. Still had, um, my assistant said, ah, well, don't waste your time uh, revising uh, that translation. You know, it was done by so-and-so, he was a PhD professor and so on. Uh, so we uh, finally enough. He's very, he should be reliable. So I said, uh, yeah, you, you are right. You may be right. And I sent off the 8,000 words to the client. And a few weeks later, it came back with a stern message telling me, um, we have had our engineers look at your translation, and uh, there are numerous mistakes. And uh, we think that you should uh, look at it and uh, redo the translation. So, stupid me thought, well, that's very unfair because we used uh, a learned colleague to do it. And uh, without looking at uh, the mistakes they had found, I sent a response to, their, to that client saying, uh, almost, how dare say, you say that? You know, uh, we only use the best, and this is one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there may be some uh, uh, mischievous uh, intent behind all that, and you are trying to decry us and uh, to unfairly criticize us. And I kept piling and piling and piling uh, stuff that I later on uh, regretted, you know, because the next day I looked at their corrections. And I almost fell off my chair. <laughs> they were 100% right. Wow. So I sent them another message saying, uh, Yeah, I'm sorry you were right. Uh, I can see uh, there are many mistakes. Uh, of course, it may be due in part to the fact that uh, your document is terribly badly written, which they acknowledged. Uh, but it should have been translated uh, more carefully and revised more carefully and we were in a hurry and uh, we were trusting the translator and, uh, you know, all kinds of lame excuses, of course. Uh, and uh, suggesting, yes, we'll um, check the translation and make all necessary corrections. Uh, can we have uh, two weeks, please? And they said yes. So, I uh, enrolled a professional engineer to work with me. The, the problem was that uh, he spoke uh, perfect English and uh, perfect Hungarian. 
So, I worked with him, uh, literally retranslating the French into English. And he would tell me, uh, yeah, engineering circles, this is what you say, this is what you say. And uh, yeah, your guy didn't understand uh, anything. And uh, so the two of us basically rewrote the whole 8,000 words. Uh, it took us another two weeks. I was kind enough to give us another two weeks. And uh, by the time we had finished, um, I had to pay the engineer another $1,500. I had spent uh, about an hour, 100 hours of my own time. Um, we got the weeks. And there were about 50 hours of uh, support staff time. So basically, the, the whole job had to be written from scratch. And then I delivered it to the client, waited, with his breath, and uh, the response came back from the client and he said, uh, You guy really got it, that's excellent. Uh, this time, really, that's what we would expect from you. And I had a big sigh of relief. I thought, all right, all that effort, all those expenses, all those costs, after all, were well worth it. Of course, I'm not making a dime on this. I mean, even uh, be out of my own pocket. But I can look at myself in the mirror and uh, still be proud of myself. Uh, <clears throat> now, when I relayed all that to uh, the translator, he said, uh, well, you did not quite understand uh, why it all happened. <coughs> and then uh, he said, well, um, I, yeah, I would like to offer some kind of a compensation to you. Um, I did a small job for you the other day. Uh, um, it's worth $100, so I won't charge you for it. serious research, which I ended up doing, or work in tandem with an engineer uh, to do it. Otherwise, uh, you don't accept the job. You have to, as we said, uh, your ethics should dictate that you be honest enough to say, uh, no, you know, even if you are broke, I won't touch it, because I, I can tell the result is going to be atrocious. But he did it. Uh, full knowledge, I think, of what he was doing, and uh, the gold blood. So. Well, uh, when I, I worked a lot with uh, poorly written originals, yeah. and I know that I have a lot of questions. I look at the text, and I don't know what to do. Uh -huh. So for me, this is an immediate red flag, when I know that the, the original is very poorly written, uh -huh. and the translator doesn't ask any questions. And just sends you off the translation. So it didn't, you, like it wasn't, you, you weren't suspicious of the no. practice at that point. No, because I dealt with that translator for many years without uh, any big problems. You know, I knew it was great. But uh, all right, uh, for a general type of copy, it was okay. Um, I mean, I've been a professor of uh, medieval literature. Uh, so. But he was certainly not uh, a technical translator, certainly not. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was 
part of my responsibility. I, I should have known he's not the right guy. I should keep looking around. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I put my phone in the way. The, the, the bug has to stop somewhere. But you trust people enough to think, well, if he's not feeling comfortable with this, he will tell me. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what happens sometimes when uh, you subcontract. That's why I'm happier now being uh, a freelancer. Although I still subcontract sometimes. <laughs> but I have a lot more comfort. <laughs> we always learn in this wonderful profession. Now, to turn to the interpreters, uh, they face the same kind of problems, although confrontations are more personal and direct, especially in a consecutive interpretation setting, when one may sit at the same table as the complainer or corrector. Um, I'm sure most of you who do interpretation work here have had that kind of uh, wonderful experience where you see someone um, interrupting you and uh, correcting you. Um, and um, usually one will just shut up and continue with the meeting, or sometimes one um, may uh, react. Um, for instance, uh, I remember reading about uh, uh, Paul Schmidt, Hitler's uh, interpreter, who at the start of his career um, was uh, doing consecutive interpretation because that was the only interpretation around at that time. They were simultaneous at the table uh, with uh, many uh, high ranking um, individuals and heads of states and so on. And um, he said he was constantly being interrupted by uh, Neville Chamberlain, who um, wanted to show that uh, he spoke some French. <laughs> and um, yeah, he let him make uh, his comments, and uh, I'm sure the, the other people around the table um, didn't uh, say anything, but they must have thought, uh, if only Chamberlain could shut up for a while, <laughs> nice. Um, I had more or less the same experience myself at the beginning of my career. I was uh, working at a uh, meeting around the table and um, it was uh, English and German and uh, everything was going well until uh, a young lady came over who was part of that organization, sat at the table and uh, started uh, making uh, well, mimics and gestures and, uh, and even interrupting and then suggesting uh, other words and things like that. To the point that our family uh, said, look, uh, Lee, uh, why don't you take over? You know, if you're so great, uh, I'll be glad to, to let you take over. And uh, so uh, the, the conference organizers uh, discreetly told her to keep quiet or leave the room. And I was thankful for that. Uh, there is also the well-known uh, remark by uh, George Kaminker, who uh, at a meeting uh, was told by a diplomat, uh, uh, Sir, um, you did not translate uh, what I said. And Kaminker answered, uh, uh, Yeah, but uh, this is what you should have said. <laughs> So, whoever said that there is no excitement in our profession? Nobody oh. <laughs> <But we> can <laughs> contradict that. There will always be complainers, whiners, and self appointed linguists. Their presence in our professional environment is as good as inevitable. Like the flu, income <laughs> tax, traffic tickets. Bed bugs, 
my bed. Just came back from New York. And uh, we better accept it as a fact of life and be prepared to cope with it. If some people criticize our work unfairly, that must be because they envy us. <laughs> so, learn to live with it, take it in stride, and with a pinch of humor. And, yeah, always remember to be proud of yourself and of your work. Um, incidentally, and coincidentally, uh, about a week ago, as I was finally getting to work on writing this presentation, uh, I was sitting at the picnic table in uh, Trinity Bellwood Park, and uh, two young men addressed me and uh, introduced themselves as students who were doing a survey. So fine. They asked if I wanted to take part in the thing. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> they asked me to define the word pride. Proud. So I gave them a few definitions. Um, and um, yeah, I told them that uh, we should be proud of, uh, not of ourselves, but of the work we do, the contribution we make to uh, society, to, to our fellow men and women, and um, that we should be able to look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning when we get up, even if we're all scruffy. But still look at yourself. And, and more important than the mirror is uh, the eyes of the others, because they will let you know whether what you are doing is right or not. And um, to conclude, I think uh, <laughs> um, it sounds like maths. <laughs> yes, I was going to quote uh, our esteemed colleague uh, Karl Marx. Karl Marx. <laughs> He said, or he almost, uh, he almost said, or he could have said, or he should, he should say, in his uh, earth shattering revolutionary masterwork, Das Kapital. Yes, Das Kapital. Übersetzer aller Länder, vereinigt euch! All countries unite, and uh, that's what uh, I think we can see also in this uh, handout that you give. If you give us uh, united, we are stronger. In the yeah. United States, in Kentucky, where I went for the first time when I was making my first visit to the States, uh, their motto is uh, "United we stand, divided we fall." <laughs> And coming from Belgium, I should know. <laughs> Union fait la force. Mm -hmm. Together we are stronger. Eindracht macht macht. They say the northern part, although Flemings and uh, Walloons are not the best examples of the United uh, People. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for your attention.